Welcome to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White, the real dragon slayer, author and entrepreneur sales coach. Tune in weekly for human conversation about business and sales. Enjoy business expert interviews, educational episodes, and virtual cuppers with entrepreneur business owners. So grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy. Here is your host, Jules White. So welcome everybody to the human conversation. I have a fascinating man with me today. That's what I'm going to call him because I feel that way about him. He is Jeremy Hunter. He is the founder of Jeremy Hunter Consulting. We're going to talk about that later. But Jeremy, welcome to the Human Conversation. Thank you for inviting me, Jules. I'm, I'm very flattered and pleased to be here. We had a really fabulous uh, virtual cuppa. And I actually think you weren't in the UK at the time. Um, And we had this amazing conversation and I knew that I needed to have you on my podcast. You're such an interesting man. So I thought you were never going to invite me, Jules. I saw you. (laughs) (laughs) Wondered who who I had to bribe to get on. But but thank you anyway. Well, I think I think I think the money I got in the post was from you. But I mean, it didn't have a name. Well, yeah, if if it was coins, it would have been. Yeah. (laughs) So, Jeremy, one of the things I must just tell the listeners is that when I asked how to introduce you, you said something about um, a celebrity from LinkedIn. Was that right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm officially the eighth funniest person on LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, I have a huge following, primarily from my family, um, but, but also there are one or two other people who follow me as well. So. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so there's lots to get through because there's lots I want to talk about with you. But I always start on my podcast with that question around when you left school, Jeremy, what was it that you wanted to do? Oh, so that's that's a fabulous question. And I think one of the things that, that we we did and we still do is expect that teenagers who basically don't know how to wash themselves and clean their rooms somehow understand what they're going to do with the rest of their lives and and like most teenagers I think I had no idea so Mm. I was the privileged generation where we still had free university education and we also had uh, we even got a grant from the government to pay our living expenses so so further education was something that was was it was on my agenda and it was definitely delaying the inevitable going into the workforce, but I had no idea what I wanted to do when I, in inverted commas, grew up. Mm. So I did what I was interested in. So I, I was fascinated and still am by politics. And I, I did it, I signed up for a degree in, in politics and modern history at, at the University of Manchester. But I decided that was all too soon. So I took a, a gap year and I, I, I worked in a mental hospital for, for a while cleaning cleaning in a in a hospital uh, I worked in a caravan factory and then I spent um, about three or four months traveling around the U.S. with a friend of mine and and catching the Greyhound buses and hitchhiking and and going to all these places that I'd seen in movies and on tv but 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 never had the opportunity to visit and it was fantastic I was committed to my university career and so I was very happy to get back into to education by the time I'd finished that year. Um, but I still had no idea. I still had no idea. So I was, I was always uh, a good writer and people said, oh, you should be a journalist. So I thought, oh yeah, that's interesting. And a, and a good friend of mine became a journalist and he was working on a local paper that I won't name. Um, one of the first jobs he had was a local politician that committed suicide and his job was, as a journalist was to go and doorstep the widow and try and get some feedback from her. And I thought, I don't really think that's going to be me. I started to think about business um, and, and was that the way to go? And I, and I got more and more interested as I went through my course. Uh, and then if, if I'm going to go into business, which function do you choose? And you'll be, I hope, delighted to hear that I chose sales. Yay! Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and here here was my logic, which I, I still think is is valid. 
if you went into sales, straight away, they gave you a territory, they gave you customers, they gave you responsibility, um, and you, were, you had a real job. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought, well, this is great because you can straight away have some independence, some autonomy, and some real responsibility and, and measure whether you're any good or not. So, mm -hmm. so to me, that was like, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, and and I also the, the the other rationale that I have is is whatever you do in your in your life or your career, at some stage you're going to need to be able to sell yourself or sell your ideas or convince somebody, you know. And, and whether that's convince your boss, whether it's convince your fiance, whether it's to convince whoever, um, you're going to need some of those skills and, and persuasion yeah. so that's when I then totally focused on on getting myself a, a sales role as soon as I graduated which is which is what I did much to I have to say the disappointment of my father my my father uh, left school at 16 so I had no further education did a little bit of an apprenticeship fixing vacuum cleaners then he did national service then he came back and he, he wangled his way into selling the vacuum cleaners. So he was a Hoover salesman door to door. Um, and he was, I was the first person in, you know, rather like Joe Biden or Neil Kinnock, I was the first person in a thousand generations to go to, to university. And my father was so proud that I'd been to university and then said to me, and now you're selling like I was. What, what <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jeremy, but there's a few things here for me. The first thing I wanted to ask about, well, I wanted to tell you that my dad, when he was in his 20s, he would get on the tube in London with a vacuum cleaner and knock doors and sell <laughs> that vacuum cleaner. So there's the first synergy between us. I wanted to ask you about the gap year, because I wonder how important that is in the process of getting to understand who you are and what you want to do? Because you hear about people doing these traveling gap years. What, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I would encourage everybody that can to do that. So uh, I know for, for me, uh, I mean, it, not that I was aimless, but I, I had no clue what I wanted to do. But, but, you know, the pressure is on teenagers now as it was then. Um, and I did, you know, I worked, worked pretty hard for, I don't want to be one of those people that said I, I didn't do any work or whatever. I studied hard. So I studied hard and took what were then O levels and then straight into the sixth form and studied hard for A levels. So, you know, for, for me, I'd, I'd spent three long years studying and then the, the logical next step was straight into university and another three years of what would be hard slog. And I said to myself, I'm not sure that I want to commit to all of that. So I want to see a bit of the world for sure. Um, and I'd like to take a, a, a bit of a breather from study and, and not tax my brain so much and, and go and do something quite different. When you can, uh, whether you call it a gap year, a sabbatical, uh, you know, mental health break, whatever you want to call it, if, if you can... If you can step off that treadmill of education or step off the work treadmill, I think it's good for you. Very much in favour. Yeah, me too. You know, I never did it myself, but I hear people who have done it. And then I think, actually, I think that's such a great period for you to get clarity on things. And, and so it's, it's great to hear that you did. Now, I want to take you back then to your beginning of your sales career. So who were you actually working for then? You decided so, to go into sales. Yeah, well, I, I worked for... Um, it was then known as Johnson Wax, but now is SC Johnson. Um, and I was an industrial salesman and I was selling to um, institutions, so schools, hospitals, um, hotels, and, and all of those sort of things. So fantastic, fantastic sharp end experience. Mm. Um, wonderful company, good training. I worked for them for, for a while and then I, I transitioned into a sales role with Beach and Pharmaceuticals, which was again rather a different a different industry, but but a, a fantastic training school. I mean, mm. Beecham, of course, later became Smith Klein Beecham and then Glaxo Smith Klein, but but was the best training school I think I've I've ever been through. I mean, we before we were allowed to go and see a, a real live customer, spend five weeks in in a training school, 
Yeah. And the stuff that I learned then is stuff that stood me in good stead for the rest of my life. It's interesting, actually, because I, my, I suppose my more, most intense sales training was when I was at Yellow Pages. And, they, oh, yeah. and that was yeah. uh, two weeks residential. So for you to say it was five weeks, you know, that, that just shows you the intensity of, of how they were training you back then. I think one of the things about you, you say, you know, do we have intense sales training anymore? I suspect yes is the answer. What I'm curious about, Jeremy, is how much we've evolved that training. Because, you know, my, my passion and my, my thing is all about putting the human stuff into the training that we give in sales. And, and, and I don't believe that we do that as much as we can. And I think focuses can shift in my opinion, in how we train sales, but because I think people buy people. And I think actually, if you start with the human stuff, you get your revenue times five times 10, you know, and we start usually in the bigger companies that I've worked in, here's your target, here's how much money you want to make. Now let's go and sell. And for me, I want to switch that. I want to switch that round, Jeremy. So, but yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, 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 the interesting part for me was we did the Xerox program, uh, and then we, we diverged into a different kind of program which had more of a psychological aspect to it. So there was, you know, to your point, a little bit, I mean, the Xerox was great, but it was a little bit mechanical. Mm. Um, and, and the program we then started to use acknowledged that, you know, you're dealing with different people and it wasn't, wasn't Myers-Briggs kind of stuff, but it was similar. You know, that these, these are the dominant personalities and how to deal with them. These are the aggressive guys. These are the introverts who won't give you any answer. Yeah. You learned how to deal with the different personality types that you would meet on your, on the road, you know. Mm. So, mm. so your career has taken off. You've worked for some amazing brands. So tell me how you start to work your way around the world, because I obviously know bits of your story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I don't know whether anybody from Beecham will hear this, but, but it was a great school. It was a great school, but but... I, I was I was on a fast track with them, so I, I I got promoted twice in four years, and I was I was a sales manager running my own team at 26. So I was you know I was doing doing reasonably well, and and then applied for the national sales manager's job. So that would have mean running a team of 120 or 150 people or something across the UK, hundreds of millions of pounds of revenue and and all of this sort of stuff. And they said, we, we think you're doing well, but we don't think you're quite ready for that. <laughs> and, and, and here's what we think you're missing. And, and you know, very detailed feedback on, on where the gaps were and what additional experience I needed to get and so on. And so I said, yeah, that, thank you for the feedback and I appreciate all that. But by the time I've all done all of that, I'll be 30. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you know, and it, it will be too late. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I guess I, I got itchy, itchy feet in that sense. And then miraculously or otherwise, I, I applied for a role in, in the textile business with Coates Viella as part of their international management. So um, they, they had an um, international management program where you, you basically sign your life away. You said, well, I'll, I'll go and work overseas, but I'll go and work where you send me to. So this sounded fabulous to me because you, you got the opportunity to work overseas. You got the opportunity to, to have more responsibility. They threw you in at the deep end and a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, but it was a risk. So, uh, you know, at the time I had a young baby who was, you know, not, not quite a year old and my wife was pregnant. And, and I was on a fast track at Beecham and, and decided, well, I'm going to throw all that away and, and take this job. And I, I guess I landed on my feet a little bit. They sent me to Portugal, um, where I spent three and a half years um, in Porto. And, and I mean, this is the 80s. Portugal was a lot different than to it is now. And it was it would recently emerged from kind of a, a sheltered revolutionary period and, and by European standards was was relatively poor, relatively isolated and, and so on. Um, and it was an emerging market. So it was a, it was a great experience for me to, to, to be thrown in at the deep end there and suddenly be running logistics, finance, 
operations, all sorts of stuff that I hadn't previously done um, in a foreign language. The company sent me on a three week crash course in, in Portuguese and then said, right, off you go. And you know, you're, you're not on your own. There's a, there's a, there's a management structure there, but, but it was an um, unbelievable experience really. And I, I wasn't much of a, a linguist at school, but if you, you know, for anybody listening or watching, if you've got doubts about learning a foreign language, go and live in the country and, and immerse yourself. And that, that's the way to learn. I mean, it, you've got to apply yourself. So it's, you know, I used to, I used to go into to work probably an hour early and, and work on my verbs, you know, to try and learn what he said, she said, you said, what, you know, the, the equivalent. Um, just so that you wouldn't sound like I go warehouse now, see customer, you know, I mean, it, it, so that you at least can, can construct a sentence. So, um, so you, you know, you apply yourself a little bit, but, but it was, I mean, like lots of things in life, there's no choice. No. So if you, if you want to be good at your job in those days, apart from a, num a handful of very educated people, nobody spoke English, none of the sales guys, none of the customers, none of the warehouse guys. So it was, you know, you, if you want to try and make yourself understood and understand what's going on and, and do your job properly, you've got to learn the language. So yeah. can you still speak Portuguese now, Jeremy? Yeah, I can, Jules. And I, I, it's, it's back there in my memory. So we, we take holidays in Portugal quite regularly. And I, it, it takes a couple of days to, to click in like that. But once it clicks in, it's back. And, I, you know, it's, it's still there in the depths of the memory bank Amazing. so the vocabulary is probably not what it what it should be there's a lady that um i do a clubhouse room every monday evening and there's a lady yeah. who comes into that room and i think she speaks it's either eight or nine languages and it's just phenomenal isn't it when you hear people speak that many languages you can't get your head around it and i i, I have a friend like that and he, he's, yeah he's he's half swiss half portuguese so he's got i think french german and, and italian from switzerland plus portuguese plus he could beat you or me at scrabble in english and he's got all of this and i said how do you do it and he said just imagine a filing cabinet and you go to the filing cabinet and you open that drawer and that's the language you need and I, I guess if that that works for them, I, I, it yeah. doesn't work for me. My brain's not not yeah. well structured enough. I don't no. think so. Amazing, very but you impressive. Are, but, but you are very disciplined. I hear that in the things that you tell me. You're a disciplined man, you know, because to go in an hour early and practice your verbs and things like that—that's discipline, Jeremy. You know, it's obviously in there that that discipline. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, somebody said to me recently, which I thought was I was offended initially, but. They said, I like your persona on LinkedIn. And I said, persona? It's not, uh, this is who I am. But, but of course, you know, you can be humorous and you can be shambolic or whatever on the surface. But, but the reality is I, I am quite a disciplined person in business. And, and the fact that I enjoy a laugh and a joke doesn't mean I don't take the rest of my life and my work seriously. And, exactly. you know, that... Light, lightening the mood isn't isn't the same as trivializing things. No, it's so, not. It's not. And, and right. actually, on on LinkedIn, and I'm a, 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 a fan, as you know, Jeremy. Um, on LinkedIn, what I love about you is I'll get humor. I get some serious content, which is actually thought provoking. And then I also get the whole music stuff, of course, which we are going to touch on. So I've got so much I want to talk to you about, but I want to continue the journey around the world because actually we're only in Portugal at the moment. And I know that you go a little bit further afield than Portugal. So how did you come to then move on to that next place? Oh, yeah. Well, you see, <laughs> the, the, the contract that I signed said I will go anywhere. And, and so you don't get a choice. And, and that, I was fine with that at the beginning. And I'm certainly fine with it looking back. So having had, I think, three and a half years in, in Portugal, my, my assignment in Portugal finished and they, um, the company sent me to Turkey. So I was in charge of business development for the Middle East. We had a, a fantastic business in Turkey. I mean, hugely profitable, very successful. But my boss, who was a Turk, was quite a visionary. And he said, we need to find the next Turkey because Turkey is, is going to develop and grow and wage levels are going to increase and people no longer work, want to work in textile factories. They want to be venture capitalists and, and you know, management consultants and, and whatever. 
So your job, go and find me the next turkey. At the time, the Soviet Union had just collapsed. So I'd spent time traveling from, I lived in Istanbul and I traveled into the former Soviet Union. So Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all of the stands. I, I was traveling in, in and out of those places. Food was difficult to get, fuel was difficult to get, and, and they were trying to rebuild. So they were looking for foreign investment. They were looking to, to open themselves up to, to business and so on. And, and a lot of those um, republics have um, ethnic and cultural links to Turkey. So there was, a, there was a logical kind of link to that. And I would go off on a Sunday night with you know, about a couple of thousand US dollars tucked in my waistband of my jeans and, and disappear. And I mean, there was no, of course there's no email or, or text or anything. Um, but there was no fax either. I mean, we, we were communicating with them with, by telex. So I would disappear on, at the beginning of the week and, and luckily appear back on a Friday night, safe and sound, but, but no contact with the family or anything. So yeah. it, was, uh, it was real frontier stuff. And I, I spent a lot of time there, a lot, a lot of time in Iran, um, and a lot of time in Egypt, in Cairo. And after the, I guess, the feasibility studies and all of that were done, I made a, a recommendation that we invest in, in Cairo and, and here's, the, here's the plan. We put a, a, a plans in the desert just outside of Cairo and we get this support from the government. And here's, if we do that, here's what it looks like and, and so on. And, and the, the board approved the, the investment plan and then said to me, if you think it's such a good idea, you better go and run it. Oh. So then- <laughs> Off to Egypt. <laughs> yeah, <that's> the, <laughs> The sales guy's worst nightmare is like, no, I, I just did the plan. I'm not supposed to execute. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. absolutely brilliant. I, I, I loved living in Egypt. I mean, it was a, it was a fantastic experience for me. It just, and, and a whole lot of stuff that I'd never done before. So we, had, we, we set up a joint venture with a local company, um, had to get all the approvals from the government. You know, so I was dealing with lawyers, I was dealing with the Egyptian government, um, obviously the joint venture partner, the, the, the whole thing. And I was you know, still in my very early thirties then, just getting all of this, absorbing all of this experience and, and so on. Um, until, and I, I, I think I told this story yesterday, until they came and we, we looked at the five-year plan. And I said, look, this, this is the projection this is what it looks like. And, and the only way that you can really make this work is, is to take me out of the equation because it's a startup, it's a, it's a fledgling business. You know, you, you, need, you need somebody who is uh, either get one of the local guys or, or somebody who's, you know, not got all the expat baggage that I've got. And then you can make the business fly. Um, and they nodded wisely and said, yeah, that's right, you're fired. It, it didn't happen quite as, as dramatically as that. Your post, was, your post was very interesting yesterday about that, Jeremy. So it's lovely that you've mentioned it because I remember reading it, you mm. know, and, and it was interesting to sort of compute that and decide, well, actually, that, that feels really harsh, doesn't it, that they would <clears throat> get rid of you, you know. But actually, yeah. like you say, you were expensive for a startup, weren't you? Yeah. I mean, there, there was no way that that business could thrive and survive with me in it. Um, not because I'm a bad business person, but no. because of the startup nature of it. The only way that you could really make it successful was to was to reduce the overhead to 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 get it through that launch phase. Mm. Um, and it, it wasn't quite as black and white as you're fired. I mean, that I expected to be redeployed, and they did. To be fair, they did. We we were talking about an option in Brazil because of the language. I you know speak oh, yeah. Portuguese. But, but also, you know, at that, that stage, Brazil wasn't the safest place for, for a family with three little kids. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about carjackings and, and there, were, there would be bodyguards taking the kids to school and bars on the windows of the apartment. And I mean, I love traveling, Jules, but, but not at the expense of personal safety or safety right. of the family. So, yeah. so we, long story short, we agreed to, to separate, which, is, which was okay. Yeah. Um, and I had the option then because I was married to a Kiwi we could either settle in UK back in the UK or we could take our chances in New Zealand and that's what I did and I, 
ironically said, right, that's it, I'm never traveling again. I'm <laughs> gonna stay in New Zealand for the rest of my life. Famous last words, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, skipping two, two steps, I guess, I, I divorced and remarried. Um, and I, I was working, I was hired as the managing director of Sellotape in, in New Zealand. And my job in Sellotape was, it was, I mean, an iconic brand, of course. Yeah. Um, very well known here, very well known there, um, but not performing that well. And it was owned by private equity at that stage. And my job was to go in there, turn it around, dress it up, get the business um, back up and running profitably, et cetera. Um, and then we would sell it to a multinational. Yeah. And we sold, we sold it to a multinational, which was Henkel. Yes. And so that's how I ended up in Henkel. To my surprise, Henkel said, no, no, we're, we're, we, we like what you do and we think you've got some potential for us and we're looking for good managers, et cetera. Um, how about you stay? And so, yeah, okay. Um, but if you stay, we think you'd be better off in Australia because... New Zealand is is a small market and, and not going to grow that much and the opportunities are over the Tasman. So my wife and I talked about it and said, well, yep, yeah, let's give it a go. And we went to Australia and I did a job for Henkel in Australia. And then my boss said to me, I think you should move to India. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a very comfortable and nice lifestyle in, in Australia, but but my wife's a great supporter and we both have a similar philosophy, uh, which is that at the end of your life, you regret the things you didn't do, not the things that yeah. you did do. So, mm -hmm. so we said, well, what's the worst that can happen? Let's, let's go and, and give it a go for a couple of years. Our, our daughter was relatively young then. She was eight, seven or eight. Um, let's go for a couple of years. And two years turned into five years um, because, I mean, obviously I must have been doing a good job because they kept, renewing my contract I was gonna say yeah you must have been um, good Jeremy but, but but we also loved the place loved the people and uh, it was a uh, yeah I mean even now it's probably all, my wife's favorite place and she would go back tomorrow if if you if you offered her the chance um they call it incredible India and it really was for us an incredible place yeah. and uh business business wise was was fascinating it's you never had the same day twice it was it was a really fantastic time that we had there yeah yeah mm. and then did you end up going to China as well Jeremy yeah well it, it's I, I mean I'm, I'm not saying there is a, a strict ladder on these things but but I guess for Henkel the two biggest emerging markets were India and, and China and I was the president of our business in in India and then offered the job of president of Henkel in China, which I guess was the next logical step on the on the presidential ladder, if you like. And, um, Amazing. and I, yeah, so and, and China, I knew pretty well because I've been traveling there on and off for at least 10 years before that. Yeah. And um, had a, a great time working in, and living in, in Shanghai, which is, uh, you know, one of the world's great cities. Amazing. And. I wanted to just say, do you think your father was proud by this time? He was proud by, to be honest, he was proud by the first Christmas that I was at SC Johnson. So it yeah, was, yeah. it was okay. <laughs> Amazing. Well, well, it's a wonderful story in my mind because of just the way it's all evolved and how you progressed in business. You know, I, I was similar, but not as grand at all because I didn't do the traveling and I certainly was never called a president. But I, but I had a career that actually I forged forward because I was proactive in what's mm. the next thing I can do. I always wanted to learn. I wanted to experience all the elements of selling from the telesales up to sales director position, you know. So it was always that driver for me was what can I learn next? Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is then, you were introduced at the beginning of the podcast as Jeremy Hunter Consulting. So at some point, the listeners will gather, you're now running your own business. So tell us about that. The thing that, that and again, you mentioned my dad, so perhaps I'll, I'll take a step back and, and say a bit more about him. So he was in growing up, I mean, he was a fantastic storyteller. And he, you know, he could have the whole room in stitches and, and you know, whether it was the pub, 
the cycling club, whatever it was. And he had these great stories about when he was in the RAF, when he was selling vacuum cleaners and, and, and he really great stories. Um, and he always came home from work with a, with a funny story about what had happened that day. And, and we always said to him, you should write all this down, Dad. You know, write it down. It would be great. It would be a great book. And yeah, yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that. Um, and when he, he, he was desperate, he said, oh, I'm, as soon as I'm 62, that's it. I'm finished. I'm retiring. And I said to him, oh, but you've got 30 years of, of experience of sales, of management, of HR and, and leadership and all you can't just let that all kind of fester. Go out and do something with all of that. So, and, and I couldn't persuade him. He, he was like, no, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to ride my bike. I'm going to enjoy my, my traveling and whatever. So as, as I mean, I'm not, not at that age yet, but, but I, I thought, well, I'm not going to let my stories die and I'm not going to let some of his stories die. So that's when I started posting on LinkedIn and, and then I started to get some good feedback and oh, this is, you know, people want to, want to listen to this, which is good. Um, and then I was asked to give a couple of speeches and, and, and again, got good feedback from that. So I thought this is, this is something I, I'm, I'm happy to do. So I'm happy to share my experience. I'm happy to share my stories and, and, and try and help the next generation coming through of, young professionals or business owners and, and so on. And so that's when, when I stepped off the, the corporate treadmill, that's, that's where the Jeremy Hunter Consulting was born. So because of lockdown, I, I haven't been able to get out and about and do as many public speeches as I would like to have done, but I do mentor individuals and, and young professionals who, who want to, I don't like the expression, pick my brains, but, but, we, we discuss a variety of things, whether it's leadership challenges, whether it's uh, particular difficult employees or difficult customers or whatever. And, and I, I share my knowledge and experience and that, that gives me a lot of pleasure and seems to be well received by, by the young people and, and I'm happy doing that. Yeah. Uh, and I also do a little bit of, of turnaround consulting because I have a, a vast experience of, of businesses that are in a mess and, and need to get out of the mess. And, and quite often the, the owner of the business can't see the wood for the trees. Mm. So, so I come in and, and advise a little bit and, and tell them often the, the unpleasant truths that, that either they don't want to face up to or that they, um, they know but, but really don't want to acknowledge or whatever. And once the lockdowns and, and everybody gets back to normal, I'll, I'll go out and hopefully educate and entertain from the stage as well, Jules. Well, you certainly entertain, that's for sure. And it's funny <laughs> when you talked about your dad's storytelling, I'm thinking, gosh, that's where Jeremy must get it from then, because you're, you're a wonderful storyteller. I love Well, that, that's, that's very kind of you. I, I, I tell people I was, you know, with, sitting around the dinner table at home, I was... I wasn't even in the top three of the funny people around the table. So, so. <laughs> no, number eight. You said number eight, didn't you? <laughs> no, that, that's that's on LinkedIn. That's much <laughs> much less challenging. If you sat around our dinner table and you had my dad to compete with and my sisters, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hard to, hard to get a word in. Well, you and you also wrote a book. So tell us quickly about your book so that we we can obviously make sure people buy that. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to plug my book. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to have a little plug it's, here. Uh, it's, on, on it's, called, it's called Why Did Nobody Tell Me? How to Be Happy and Successful at Work and in Life. And it's, it's a lot of just small tips that, that I wish I'd known when I was younger. So whether that is managing yourself, whether it's managing people or whether it's managing your career, I've just tried to make it easily digestible. So it's a hundred pages or so. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you can dip in, dip out. One of my friends told me it's a great toilet book. <laughs> so I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know whether to be, I didn't know whether to flattered. be flattered or insulted. <laughs> no, you've definitely got to be flattered because it, yeah, it's, a, it's a thing, isn't it? It is a culture, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't didn't know where to put that in the advertisement for it, but 
Yeah. yeah, amazing. I love the title as well. So um, I guess just a couple of things just to finish off, which, you know, I always say I never want to stop these conversations because I can chat forever. And I think there's there's one thing I would like to make sure the listeners understand is if they're listening and they, they love listening to you, your career, your experience, and they're thinking, well, if he does mentoring, is that me? Um, well, if actually, if he turns businesses around, is my business big enough? Uh, give us a little bit of, of an idea of who you're looking to work with, Jeremy. The short answer is anybody. And I, I, don't, I don't mean that to sound either desperate or patronising. Um, but the, if, if I take the mentoring first, the way I, I generally work with people is we set up a Zoom call and, and we get to kind of chat and understand if if the chemistry is right mm -hmm. um so there has to be a kind of chemistry there that, that works for both sides we enter into a very very informal relationship so i charge a monthly fee which is a which is an extremely reasonable fee but i don't i don't have any contracts i don't have any commitments and i i, I don't believe in tying up people for for months and thousands and thousands of pounds so it's a surprisingly reasonable fee um that I charge every month and, and we, we take it from there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I feel when I do my coaching because mm. I feel like, and you know, I'll, I'll stay with someone for as long as they want me to ultimately. But actually, if I've done a really good uh, piece of coaching with somebody, they should then be able to, and I hope they are able to move on with confidence. You know, that's that's really yeah, what it's about, absolutely. isn't it? And, and, business, and businesses, I, I think that so far, and, and I, I think this is the way it will continue, it's the small to medium enterprise, let's say, that need the help but are intimidated by the Deloitte's or the McKinsey's or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it makes mm. sense. And how amazing yeah. to have you on their team, for sure. Well, I, I, I think it's a pleasure and a privilege for them, but, but more for me, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I like doing it. I like yeah, doing it. yeah. yeah. I mean, two two things that always that I always try and get across to people on turnarounds. One is, um, what got you here isn't going to get you there. So, and that's whether it, whether that's the strategy, whether it's the the people that you're using, whatever, you're going to have to change something. Mm. So that that's number one. Number two is, the market's not your friend. So what I mean by that is is. Typically, you go. Somebody goes in for a, for a turnaround, and they think, you know, grow the top line, and and we'll get ourselves out of the mess. Um, and that's the one thing you can't control. You can't control the external market or the environment, whatever. And you have to focus on the things that you can control. And typically, that that's your own costs, your efficiencies, your your purchasing, whatever it might be. And that doesn't mean you automatically go in and fire everybody, but it does mean try and, try and control the things that you can control. And, and I never no. forget the, the words of an old sales and marketing director who was not in that position for very long, Jeremy, but he was my boss uh, when we were failing our target by many millions uh, and asked him what we should do. And he would say, sell more. And that was always his answer. Um, and, and, you know, it makes me smile now, but at the time it was quite traumatic being in that team, you know? <laughs> no, well, so. it, it, you, there is, I mean, I, I am glib about it, but, but I mean, there's only two ways to fix your business. And one is to sell more and the other is to spend less. Um, yeah. and, and typically spending less is easier than selling more. Uh, but I like the message that is one of look after the things that you can control because that's such a cool life message as well, isn't it, Jeremy? Oh, absolutely. And and I think, it, you know, whether it, it, it relates to your family life or your work life or whatever, I mean, there are, and a little bit like happiness. I mean, it, your happiness comes from inside, not from outside. So, yeah. Yeah, so I don't exactly. imagine that. That, that buying extra stuff is going to make you happier because it typically doesn't, you know. So I've saved the very best thing to talk to you about, and that is music. And I, I think you guessed I may want to talk about this because it's my passion. Um, <laughs> my, my son is now in college doing music production. So, you know, it's coming through the family, which is marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> no well the, 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 that's where you and I are different in that, that you actually have a degree of musical talent which I, I don't so I, I'm 
<laughs> but, but, yeah, but but let me challenge you on that, Jeremy, because your musical talent is in the knowledge and the wonderful stories that you tell around music and also you. performers, you know, and every Sunday we are treated on LinkedIn. If you follow Jeremy and you really must, I always tell people you must follow these people. Um, he treats us to such wonderful stories and introduces me to new music. It might not even be music that I like the genre of, but I will go to that YouTube video and I will watch it and I always get something from it, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not even joking. I'm, so I, oh, I love I'm, it. I'm happy. I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that. I mean, it's a, it's it was a passion and, and has been a passion all my life. So I used to ride home from school on my bike on Thursdays and I used to buy the, the New Musical Express and the Melody Maker religiously every week and read them from cover to cover and i just in those days used to spend all of my money on lps and, and records yeah, yeah. and then subsequently too much of my money on cds <laughs> and, and astonishingly now every everything in the world is available pretty much for free <laughs> I, th I think there was something special though jeremy because i'm from the same generation as you and i think there was something very special about going to buy your favorite lp you know? Yeah, and, and I think kids miss out on that a little bit. And and yeah, I, I can picture where I was and where I bought, you know, a lot of the my favorite music. I can tell you which shop I bought it in and, and what I was wearing, not what I was wearing, but where I was at the time and, and yeah. so on. Yeah. And and kids now don't have that that opportunity. And I don't want to sound like one of those old old farts that, that's <laughs> like, oh, it, it's today. In my day. <laughs> yeah. But, but they consume it differently. My, my daughter is a music lover, so she introduces me to stuff and I introduce her to stuff. Mm. Um, but she doesn't, you know, I said, well, haven't you listened to the rest of the album? She went, what album? And so it, she has no interest in kind of going album by album, which is the way... We used I, to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. She, she's yeah. like, she cherry picks stuff. And so then yeah. she comes back and says, oh, all right, then put, do me a playlist. So she won't actually go and get the album but she will if I somehow dress it up as a playlist or whatever yeah. so yeah, yeah. No, it's exactly the same with Sam my son and one of the things I love is is when I say to Sam listen to this and it's say a really cool 80s tune because obviously I'm an 80s mm. girl and he's just like oh wow this is great mum because actually right now the 80s for these youngsters it's just king. They love it. They've all gone back to the eighties. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah, well, it, she's she's wised up to it a little bit now. But but it used to be, you know, the, there's a, there was a lot of cover versions, and of course, there's lots of samples. And I hear the sample, and I say, "Hey, Isabella, listen to this." Boom. She went, "That's the same." It's, like... <laughs> it's the original. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. I mean, some of the covers are actually not not too bad, but it is lovely to introduce your children to the original and then them say, oh, oh yeah. wow, that's so good, Mum. Yeah, that's, so we, we have a, it's a quite a nice little ritual, actually, if, if my wife's out or doing something else. We sit down with a with a, with a laptop or the, the phone and, and she'll do, hey, I think you might like this, and I'll listen to it, and, and then yeah. I'll say, well, if you like that, you might like this. And yeah. it's, it's quite a nice little father-daughter thing that we do. It's great. Yeah, and same for us. We do mother-son, so it's lovely. We, we are very much in sync, you and I, Jeremy, I think, in a lot of the things that we like and love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been so lovely to have you on the podcast and chat to you. Um, as I've always. enjoyed it, Jules. Thank you for inviting me. I no, appreciate it's, it. it's a pleasure. I guess one last thing just to leave the listeners with, a quote or, a, you know, just a one-liner, what would you say to the listeners having listened to your lovely journey? My very, very favourite quote is, well, I had two, but, but Mark Twain, who says that in 20 years' time, you'll regret the things that you didn't do, not the things that you did do. And so leave the safe harbour and explore, dream, discover. And, and I think that's a bit of a, a mantra for me, yeah. that, that really take some risks, try some different things, and you may surprise yourself and enjoy them. There you go. So explore, dream, discover. We have a title for our podcast today. Absolutely. I love Absolutely. that. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you, Jules. It's been Wonderful. a pleasure.
Yeah. And listeners, I really hope you've enjoyed this journey that we've had around the world with our Jeremy. Um, and he's such an interesting guy. You really, really have to follow him. You'll love his content on LinkedIn. And if you need mentoring, if you've got a turnaround you're looking at, if you know somebody, just get them connected to Jeremy. And if you like this podcast, then we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and you can see our beautiful faces on YouTube too. But please subscribe and like, and until next time, we'll see you again. Ta-ta for now. You've just been listening to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White. To find out more about the other work that Jules does, please visit her website, www.liveitloveitsellit.co.uk. And if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave a rating and review on the platform you use to enjoy her show. Thanks for listening and see you next time.